I was a working musician from the age of 14 on, and I uh, never expected to become a, a sociologist. And I had a hand injury, and I had to change careers. Uh, but I learned a great, I mean, what I learned uh, about cooperation, I learned from the fact that, you know, from this very early age, uh, um, I had to work with other people uh, to live. You know, I was on tour all the time and um, constantly cooperating with others. And I asked myself, after I had to make this change, well, was that all some that art stuff? Was that all something that had nothing to do with everyday social life? And uh, maybe the very biased answer, I said, no, 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 the life you knew when you were working as an artist has something to do with, the, with everyday life. And this is, this is one of the connections that to become a really good professional musician, you have to cooperate professionally. You have to be skilled in it. You have to learn how to listen. Uh, you need to know when to assert yourself and when to fall back. Um, you need to learn what people want to do but can't really get done in their fingers. It's very much similar to we ha the situation we have in everyday social exchanges, that people can't say what they mean. So you have to begin to hear with, as we say, with the third ear. So it seemed to me, um, maybe just as a, as a matter of wanting to keep these parts of my life connected, that I thought there was a relationship between art and society. When I read Theodor Adorno, the great uh, Frankfurt School sociologist, uh, I found a kind of spirit, a uh, kind of uh, uh, father in this because he was originally a musician. He was not a very good musician, but he became a great sociologist, and for him, it was the same sort of thing. So, in my own life, uh, this is a very tight connection. And it's worked for me because the work I do now is very concrete. I interview people, I work with data, um, I work with technological, various technological studies and things. But um, a way of keeping it alive for me has been to think, what would this mean if I were thinking about productivity, for instance, as a musician? And it keeps my, keeps my mind going. So, I don't know, maybe that's why it's a very odd kind of political economy that I practice. <laughs>
Massive workers are part of the organization as well. They should have a voice in what happens. Uh, and they should be able to get shares of the enterprise. So, you know, it's a matter of distributing both power and wealth. If you have no structure for cooperation, uh, then they are peons. They do what they're told. And that is what I'm saying to you. That's a very poor recipe for productivity. Uh, and the most surprising thing to me about the studies we've done is that um, uh, hourly or weekly wage gains are not much of a motivator for productivity. And people want more. They want what Phelps calls by flourishing. They want to think that they, they have a stake in the company, that they're recognized, they're given a certain measure of dignity and respect, that their voice counts, even if they're the simplest workers. Um, so to me, this is not, uh, I am very idealistic, but this is not an idealistic proposal. This is a better way to run the economy, and it's more democratic. I have to admit that I'm dependent on other people. Well, of course, you know. But in this civil society, conservative civil society model, dependence is humiliating. You're not supposed to be dependent. You're supposed to do it for yourself. And I think that's what's really wicked about it, is that it denies a fundamental human fact. We need other people to do things which we can't do for our, ourselves. And the moment we say, yes, I am dependent, we're all dependent, institutions, which we have to support, arise. So the, the question is, um, what can we be independent about? And I think there are s some things we can be independent about. I think maintaining order in communities is something we can be independent about. Uh, I think that um, being responsive uh, to neighbors, being sociable, with them is something we can independently do something about. Um, but you know, these th this is a domain of where, which is small, relatively. We were talking about ESOPs before. To make that kind of cooperation work, which is institutional, means that your employees, who are just electricians, are sweeping the floors have at the same time to cooperate, to say, yes, I'm dependent on you, I'm not, uh, I'm not your equal. And in my book on cooperation, I try to look at that kind of complexity. My view of civil society, of this notion, of this space in which people can deal with each other as equals, this is another reason why it's, for me, a sociable space, which is what I think the domain of mutual equal sociability is about. It's a kind of, um, and that's why I'm so interested in cities. Those are the places where this kind of sociability can be enacted. Town centers, bars, clubs, you know, these are places where you can have equal individuals operating with each other, but they, their experience is an experience of sociability, which seems to me very important. Um, but I, I just never bought that formula. Um, you know, as a factual matter, it's not true that the reason that civil society is weak is because the welfare, uh, welfare, states, uh, welfare states grow strong. 
in um, the Nordic countries, for instance, which have very extensive welfare states, they also have a huge number of voluntary organizations. So let's talk a little about what we mean by civil society, okay? Uh, in the views of people like Niall Ferguson, if we had less welfare state, we would have more civil society, more cooperation, so on. I think that view is wrong for two reasons. Um, one of them rather particular and the other quite general. The particular is this. It's a very conservative view in a very British or Anglo-Saxon sense, which is that you give people less and less money, for instance, to run schools or emergency rooms, but you subject them at the same time to increasing state control. This is the dirty little secret of Thatcherism, that it was not a withering away of the state. She increased the amount of surveillance, the amount of regulation of the central state. At the same time, she deprived local communities of resources. So whenever anybody from the Anglo-Saxon world hears this proposition, you know, the welfare state is destroying civil society, our particular and first reaction is this conservative formula about this is not surrendering power, but surrendering support. We have this notion in all education systems that the goal of becoming educated is to do mental rather than manual labor. And so, uh, it's crowded universities, people graduate with degrees they can't use. It's a kind of, the notion of skilled manual labor is something for people who are stupid. That's how we think. And so we create a, you know, we created a monster in which uh, there are all sorts of new crafts being created all the time, but they're not very sexy to, to uh, people. Everybody should be a lawyer, <laughs> a computer programmer, rather than a skilled nurse, right? Or an electrician. God forbid you should be a skilled electrician. So, I mean, I think part of what's happened is that we've sold people a fantasy about mobility of, in work rather than quality of work. As it happens, factually, you can make a very good life in Europe as a manu skilled manual service worker, better than uh, graduating with a degree in media studies from a university and taking the odd job because there's not enough work for you to do. But this calculation that upward mobility is more important than quality work, I think is something that um, there are lots of reasons for it, but that it's really set us as, as parents on the wrong path. And I feel the same thing. Uh, if my son said to me, I, I want to become a plumber, I have to say that honestly, I would say, really, you don't, you don't want to try for something more manual, more mental, more upward. You know, I, I would have a moment's pause. But in reality, we, we've just got to have a different kind, I, in my view, a different relation to what work is about. And this actually connects to the discussion we had before. It means seeing that manual workers are a valued part of a firm, when you mention your employer. But this takes us into something that would keep us here all day.
which is what are the skills that people need actually to develop given modern economic conditions? How do you learn to additive skills, for instance, to build one skill on top of another? I've tried to trace the ways in which the cooperativeness becomes a kind of um, surface mask under which people feel increasingly isolated and behave as isolated actors. Which means that when the institutions work against them, they have no collective resource. I give you a very uh, a concrete example of this. As you know, I did a study of middle level employees in the finance industry when the great crisis hit in 2008. The last thing these people could imagine was organizing together. So they became individual victims of this crisis. And what was not in their minds was the notion that they would be stronger if, if they organized in some way, not a traditional union, but some kind of collective um, effort. When we went into unemployment centers, and we're talking about middle class unemployed people, we're not talking about, you know, you know. When we went into these unemployment centers, everyone said, well, yes, this is terrible and I have no money and so on. I'm going to become a consultant. They never thought about starting firms together. The idea was always that under these conditions, you're on your own, institutions are something you can suspend yourself from. And it's one of the reasons that, with the exception of the Occupy movements, which are a very small number of people, more than 700 in this country, that there was no unrest because there was no mass demonstrations in America and so on. Because the notion, at least for these middle class, these new kind of unemployed people, is that they're responsible for their own fate individually. So that's a long <laughs> background to saying that what I'm interested in now is the creation of a kind of social capitalism on new terms in which there are the groups of employees and employers have a kind of social compact with each other in which co cooperation is not a set of empty words but that it actually operates the management of a firm. The Germans have this. It's called co-determination, and it goes back to the Bismarckian era. Those are very stable firms. They're very advanced. They're very innovative, but they are collective enterprises. They are a kind of social capitalism. But under the rule of this flexible capitalism, that kind of co-determination is absent elsewhere in the world. People talk about the state versus the economy, which is a wrong opposition. We have to do more experiments which, with what are called in English ESOPs. That is an employee-owned uh, company where the employees have shares in the business, where they are small shares, but nonetheless, they are part of the structure of ownership. I'll describe to you in Britain a very um, successful instance of this. It's called the John Lewis Organization. Uh, it owns um, grocery stores, um, what else? Furniture stores, it has a big online service. All the employees get shares in the company. The longer they work, the more shares they get. It has very high rates of productivity because everybody has a stake in it beyond their jobs. 
Uh, people contribute to their own pensions willingly, which doesn't happen the rest in Britain. It's uh, what we call a, a poster child, you know that expression in English, you know, a kind of shining model of how to have an ESOP uh, operate in an advanced economy. Um, one of the things that I find depressing is that with all the talk about and something else during this year of the cooperative that we were talking about, we think about cooperatives for very poor people, micro, you know, these micro investments and so on. What we don't think is that cooperatives, this, this ESOP form of corporate management, is modern. But in fact, it can be very, very modern. Another example of how it works is, for instance, large-scale doctor's offices operate, operated as a shared endeavor in which the, and we have some examples of this, like Kaiser Permanente in the United States, which are co cooperative. They don't look like um, uh, groups of very poor people together. Uh, they're highly productive because they're highly motivating to everybody who's within the cooperative. So it's a question. What finance capitalism has now is that fewer and fewer people are owners of the businesses uh, in which they operate. Um, uh, and, you know, public public lim limited liable liability companies. Do you know what that is? You, you know, where you, people at the top uh, have a limited liability are nonetheless very hierarchical structures in which the people at the very top determine the rewards everybody else gets. So this cooperative movement is the enemy of that. Uh, it's about partnership about cooperation, about the, the, the productive motivation that comes from including more people in the power structure of a company. And let me say one more thing about this. You pressed a button that uh, I've given this speech everywhere in the world. So uh, we've done a lot of studies of employee productivity under conditions where there's a boss, and then a mass of employees, and they're working for wages, and where there's, there is a boss, but the mass of employees are earning shares. You understand, you know, where they'd be becoming. And the productivity rates tend to be about 40% greater when people are working because they're going to own part of the company they work for. And that relates to this question of, of the short-termism, uh, the short-term employment in flexible capitalism. To the degree that people are owner workers, they themselves are less liable to move, to desert a company, you know? In high tech, for instance, is a huge problem because the assets, or in media, the assets walk in and out of the door every morning, you know? I mean, what makes um, Apple a valuable company is not that it has a nice office. It's the people who work there. So the creation of loyalty among these skilled employees, and it goes all the way down, you know, people who've accumulated institutional knowledge, who know how to make things happen in the company. Depends on motivating them to stay. And a purely neoliberal regime based on wages and wealth, won't on wage wealth, won't necessarily do that. So my very long answer to your provocative short question is that we have to think about new forms of productivity that are suited to this economy, which are not those of how much do you earn in next year.
which are much more long-term and which are stable in new ways.